Hi, and welcome back to Psychology with Mr. Snyder. Today, we leave classical conditioning and we get into operant conditioning, which is conditioning that happens after an action and not at the same time. Learning targets for today, we've got quite a few, but there are a few sub-targets in between them, so it's a trade-off. We'll identify how operant conditioning and reinforcement are related. We will analyze the different types and different concepts of reinforcement. We'll interpret how rewards and punishments shape behavior. We'll interpret how schedules of reinforcement shape learning. And we'll also identify and describe some ways in which operant conditioning can be applied to society. So let's go ahead and jump right in. In operant conditioning, people and animals learn to do certain things and not to do others because of the results of what they do. They learn from the consequences of their actions. You don't touch a hot stove because at the, in a very young age, you might have done it and hurt yourself, burned yourself. You don't want to do that again. You learn from the consequences of your actions. B.F. Skinner um, was the operant conditioning guy. John Watson did classical conditioning. B.F. Skinner does operant conditioning by using something called the Skinner box. And his experiments demonstrate reinforcement. And reinforcement is the process by which a stimulus increases the chances that a behavior will occur again. And he did this with rats and food. If the rat presses the bar, they get a pellet. And if they keep pressing the bar, they will get more pellets. So that is reinforcement. It's increasing the fact or the chance that they will press the bar again. Knowledge of results is usually all that people need in order to learn new skills. So let's discuss the different types of reinforcers. Uh, primary versus secondary first. Uh, it's real easy. Primary are reinforcers that function due to, to the biological makeup of an organism. So food, water, uh, shelter, um, sex. Sex is a great primary reinforcer for most people. So those are the primary reinforcers. Secondary reinforcers are paired with primary reinforcers. Money is a, sec is a huge secondary reinforcer because we've all learned that money can be exchanged for different primary re reinforcers like food and shelter. Now the difference between positive and negative reinforcers. Positive reinforcers increase the frequency of a behavior when added in. So a person receives something he or she wants following the behavior. If you get an A on your report card, you get $20. That will increase the chance of you getting an A by adding in $20. Negative reinforcers increase the frequency of a, of a behavior when they are removed. So this is the really difficult one to grasp. In negative reinforcement, a behavior is reinforced because something unwanted stops or it is removed following the behavior. If you sit in the hot sun, you, and you get too hot, you are mo more than likely going to move into the shade because the removal of the sun increases the frequency, uh, in increases your comfort. And the little seat belt chime. If, you, if you're in your car and you don't put on your seat belt, you hear the ding. That is a negative reinforcer because it increases the frequency that you put on your seatbelt to get rid of that annoying chime. So here's a review over positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement and punishment now. Punishment is something that decreases the frequency of a behavior. And negative punishment is taking something away like uh, your parents take away your cell phone for one day each week to lower your phone bill. And there's also positive punishment, like spanking a child, adding in pain in order to decrease the frequency of a behavior. Um, rewards, like positive reinforcement, rewards help encourage learning if you're rewarded for what you do. Some psychologists prefer positive reinforcement because the concept of reinforcement 
can be explained without trying to guess what an organism will find rewarding. So um, it's easier to use positive reinforcement because those are things that everyone will find rewarding and not necessarily uh, something that someone is subjective and someone would not find rewarding. Punishments are different from negative reinforcers because punishments decrease the frequency of the behavior they follow, whereas negative reinforcements increase the frequency by taking something away. Um, most psychologists believe that it is punishment is harmful. It's much easier to reward children for desirable behavior than punish them for unwanted behavior. So look at this dog chart. Um, a lot of this conditioning stuff comes from dog things because we use conditioning in training animals. Something is given to the dog that increases the likelihood of the behavior being repeated. That's positive reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is something taken away um, to increase the behavior being repeated. Positive punishment is like spanking or adding in pain to decrease the likelihood of the behavior being repeated. And negative punishment is taking something away to decrease the behavior. So an example of negative punishment is uh, getting your getting a timeout, getting taken away from playtime so that you don't hit your sibling anymore. You lose playtime in order to decrease the likelihood of you hitting your sibling. And here are some other reasons that punishment is a problem. Uh, punishment can create anger and hostility. Punishment does not teach the alternative acceptable behavior. It only punishes the one that you are doing. Um, People who are severely punished may try to run away or leave the situation rather than change their behavior. Um, it's sometimes unaccompanied by unseen benefits that make the behavior more likely. So the kid who needs attention may misbehave because they need attention and they get it through misbehaving. And it may be imitated as a way of solving problems. So if a child is hit or spanked by their parents, they may not learn that it's wrong to hit other people as punishment. Now, schedules of reinforcement. Two types here, uh, continuous and partial. Continuous reinforcement is the reinforcement of a behavior every time it occurs. The rat hits the lever, it gets food every single time. Um, it's not always practical or possible, so a lot of things are partial reinforcement. And there's four different ways of dividing up reinforcement partially, and that is a behavior is not reinforced every time the behavior occurs. So we have the ratio schedules and the interval schedules. The ratio schedules um, and the interval schedules are both fixed and variable. Fixed ratio is reinforcement after a fixed number of responses. So the rat hits the lever, every time, every fifth time it hits the lever, it will be rewarded with a pellet. One, two, three, four, five, food. One, two, three, four, five, food. Every time. Variable ratio is a varying number of responses. So the rat hits the bar once, it gets food. Next time it's three. Next time it's 27. Next time it's five, so varying numbers of responses. Interval, think of interval as time. And so fixed interval schedule, a fixed amount of time must elapse before the subject is rewarded. So no matter if that rat hits it 8,000 times, it's not going to get rewarded until two minutes has passed, for example. And then two more minutes, and then two more minutes, it's fixed. Variable is varying amounts of time go by before between reinforcements. So um, the rat will not get it for 30 seconds, five minutes, an hour, three minutes. It varies. And I've used the rat examples because here are some real world examples. Um, you can also find this in your book, but the interval schedules, uh, fixed interval schedule, studying for a weekly quiz, getting your paycheck every two weeks. It always happens after um, an exact amount of time. Variable interval schedules, checking email or checking text messages. You can check your text messages like 50 times, but you're not going to get rewarded until you get that next text message. 
Um, the ratio schedules, uh, fixed ratio, getting one free meal after the purchase of 10 or like a soda card for BP or Marathon or North Point or whatever. Um, losing your driver's license every five violations and then you have to get it back. Uh, variable ratio is a good example is Las Vegas uh, or playing the lottery. Las Vegas, uh, you can pull that as many times as you want, but you're, it's going to be a varying ratio um, to when you're rewarded. The number of shots to score a goal in a soccer game. You may score it on the first one. You may not score it for the next 30 shots. So it's variable ratio. So let's talk about how to apply operant conditioning. Shaping is one way in which we te teach complex behaviors um, by reinforcing small steps. So in dog training, if a dog comes and sits next to you, you um, give it a treat. If it lies down next to you, you give it another treat. Then it's more likely to continue doing these behaviors. Chaining is breaking down the steps in a sequence and doing them one by one and reinforcing all of them and then putting them back together toward a final action. Um, cheerleading is a good example of chaining. They work on each move individually and then they can put them together into a final routine. And lastly, we have programmed learning. It is reinforcing correct responses. It, it's essentially a computer, but it was developed by B.F. Skinner at the time where we didn't have current day computers. And it assumes that any task can be broken down into smaller steps and it does not punish you for getting it wrong, but it does reinforce correct responses. So let's review our learning targets. We did identify how operant conditioning and reinforcement are related. We talked about the different types and concepts of reinforcement, positive and negative, um, primary and secondary. Uh, we interpreted how rewards shape punishments, or rewards and punishments shape learning, excuse me. We talked about how different schedules can shape learning, and we talked about how operant conditioning can be applied. So I'll leave you to digest that, review, and when you come back, we will talk about cognitive factors in learning. Have a great night.